Good morning. Thank you, Alex, for that. That was actually very uh, informative. I took a lot away from that. That was very good. Thank you. Hokey dokes. So, good morning. I, I work for Pivotal along with Paula and Hannah. Um, I am delighted to have had the opportunity to work at Pivotal. I think I've met some of the uh, most gifted engineers in my career and uh, some of the kindest people that I've worked with. So I'm, I'm very spoiled and I'm very conscious of that. Um, so who am I? So I am the product manager for the team that runs Pivotal Tracker. Has anyone here heard of Pivotal Tracker? Ah, oh, cool. Does anyone here use Pivotal <laughs> Tracker? Nice. Okay. Um, we uh, are based in Dublin, that's the platform engineering team, and the application team that builds uh, Tracker is based in Denver. I am a sculptor by night, I have questionable taste in music. Um, I joined the CloudOps EU team about three years ago as an engineer, my background is in engineering, and there was an opportunity to step into a product management role, and I've always been curious about that. You get to solve people problems with software, if necessary. Um, and I've actually really enjoyed it. I, I find it very um, fulfilling. So, what I would like to do today is um, maybe not cover so much of the fundamentals or the theory of software reliability engineering. There is so much out there in the wild. Um, what I would like to uh, give away is what we've learned in those three years. We, um, Pivotal Tracker is a very big uh, production level um, workload that we run. Our team is within the R&D organization, so we try to work smart and what we learn that works, we try to give away. Um, that makes, that makes a, that, that, that's the bee in my bonnet, that's what I care about. So I'm trying to share, as far and wide as possible, what has worked. So as I mentioned, Pivotal Tracker is a project management software as a service uh, offering that we run. It started as an in-house uh, project, it was a pet project built by some of the uh, engineers in labs, Pivotal Labs. And over time, from about 2006 to now, it has um, grown uh, massively. It's used internationally. We have about 100,000 monthly active users. We serve about 400 requests per second. And every day there's about 70,000 stories or chores created. So it's, it's busy. It's not a, a, a toy project that we run. It's something that carries the brand of the company. So it's something that's really respected and cared about, which gives us the ability to learn and, and, um, and teach. So this is my fabulous team, which I adore. Um, I owe Hannah one of these t-shirts. She reminded me this morning. Um, this is us in Denver. So um, as I mentioned, we are based in Dublin. From time to time, uh, we go, well, time to time, as often as possible, we go to Denver uh, just to meet the, the tracker team and to make sure that we're on the same page. Uh, there is some coordination obviously required, and it's helpful when we don't have a two hour overlap because of time zones, so this is us there. And as I mentioned, um, we've been learning and uh, we're, we're trying to give away. So I was reasoning about how can I give you enough context as well as then just get to the heart of the matter and the meat. So I figured I'd use the allegory, uh, I might stretch the allegory of a, a game. Um, so Ready Player One, that would be our team, CloudOps. We run Pivotal Cloud Foundry installations. Um, we do this over the long run, so we need to do things like upgrades and maintenance. Um, we're learning valuable things specifically about automation um, and low toil, uh, trying to do, trying to what automate away last year's work, we, we do that, and we've, we've done that very well. Um, we care about radiating what we've learned, and that's why I'm here. Player two is the tracker application, our tenant. Uh, it's used internationally by thousands of customers. Uh, Gov UK use it, uh, Home Depot in the States use it, Volkswagen. Um, this is a mature product that has now identified market fit, which is important when it comes to using site, li site reliability engineering, and I'll get to that. Um, they have users that they want to retain, so they have comp competition in the market. That is also important when you're using site reliability engineering. It's the why 
why do you do these things? It's to retain your users. Um, and let me, I'm going to step ahead and I'll start talking about the SLIs and SLOs. Player three is um, what, when I joined the team three years ago, it's an early initiative in Google to start training customers in the application of site reliability engineering. So uh, we are a Google customer. We run on Google Cloud Platform, so GCP, and um, they took the time to come and sit with us, look at uh, Pivotal Cloud Foundry, so PCF, which is the PaaS um, platform, and then look at the tracker application itself and give us an understanding or give us a starting point. They gave us a recommendation. What is a, a, a wise service level indicator? And what is given currently what you have in place? What, what is the service level objective you can drive towards? <laughs> so they gave us the where are you now? And then they helped us to bootstrap this use of site reliability engineering within Pivotal, specifically as applied to running tracker in production. So um, the thing about site reliability engineering is that book can be quite intimidating. It's very big. Um, you can do a lot and actually not get the benefit of it. So one of my observations, I speak a lot with customers, Pivotal Cloud Foundry customers, specifically their platform teams. Um, you can get this very wrong uh, by, doing, by, by not doing the fundamentals. Everything hangs off your understanding of the level of service your users need and creating tooling to help you observe that. So service level indicator, and I'll unpack that a bit. Question, um, are, how many people in the room are familiar with these concepts of a service level indicator, service level objective? Okay, so I won't belabor the point. How many of you are using these things in your workloads at the moment? Okay, not so many, okay. That's grand, that's cool. It gives me an understanding of how much ground to cover, okay. So yes, the fundamentals would be uh, your service level indicator, and I'll describe what that is, a service level objective, and I'll describe what that is, and fundamentally the policy. The policy is what happens when my users are in too much pain, when the, my service is too unstable for them to rely on, and that's an agreement we reach before that happens as to how we both will manage that situation between the platform team and the application development team. If you don't have these things in place, which some of our customers tried to do, they tried to have a site reliability team in place without these things, and they were fighting blind. They don't have a clear understanding of user pain. They don't know when people are battling. So they're firefighting with very advanced tools, but they're firefighting blind. They don't know when they're actually moving the needle on keeping their users happy and therefore preventing their users from churning. So SLIs and SLOs are your eyes and ears on the ground. They are how you navigate. So where we started with Google was understand what is and then understand what should be. So what we did with them, they're, they're based in London, is this concept of an application reliability review. So they look at the PaaS, they look at our infrastructure, they look at the application, they say, what is, given what you have in place, the best possible scenario, and what would they recommend that we use as this service level indicator? So to unpack those, that, that acronym or the SLI, you're reasoning about the level of service that your user is experiencing in their most important workflow on your app. So if the user in question is an, a tracker end user, my SLI might be when I hit www.tracker.com, I get an HTTP 200 back within X milliseconds with the content I expect. That is the English definition of my SLI. And then I create a machine, a probe, a software test that periodically hits my site and sees is this completing successfully? That's the nuts and bolts of an SLI. SLO is when you start asking, how often does that need to come back true for my user to be adequately served? So can my user rely on my service? Alrighty, so long story short also, don't panic. You're gonna, you have to, some of this is a bit of guessing in the beginning about deciding what a service level objective might be. Um, as you'll see from our examples, you learn as you go and you might adjust it. We were too strict 
originally. We, were, we did not have a very high tolerance for error, and it was unnecessarily strict, but I'll get to that. Okay, I think I might have jumped ahead, but here we go. What level of service is required by the end user? What does the user need to be able to rely on my service? Service level indicator is a, an, a proxy for that user pain. <coughs> it's a software test and it comes back happy days or sad. Uh, if, if this was an, a real user, would they have got tracker when they hit the URL or not? Service level objective is expressed in a percentage and is what percentage of time does my user need that to come back as happy, come back as true? Um, in the parlance, it's expressed in, as a number of nines, which is really what percentage of the time does this need to come back true? Percentages can be hard to reason about, so 99.9% .9 of a 30-day window of time results in, um, I, I think the number is 43, so 43 permissible error minutes, and that's termed your error budget. Um, significantly, this is not an SLA. This is not a promise. This is not, there's no financial consequence to missing this. It's an internal uh, target we set for ourselves as a team. So I'm a platform operator who is my user. My user is not the tracker end user. My user is the application developer. Um, we have a very close relationship with the tracker dev team, so we helped bootstrap their graphs, but we were creating the graphs for their end users, and that became significant also, and I'll touch on that. So how do we define and build these tools? That's a bigger conversation. That takes us about four hours with the product, with the product team to identify A, your users, B, their important workflows, and C, the, the service level objective we set ourselves. I can't cover that or do it any justice here, but those those uh, resources are brilliant, P specifically the last one. Um, I happened upon that the other day and it's crystal clear. That's what we do. Um, so if you want a URL to show you how to do it, go there. I'll give it a second if anyone wants to take a photo, okay. So nines, as I touched on, service level objectives are expressed as a number of nines. What percentage of time does your user need to be happy in order to rely, I'm not happy, what, what, what percentage of time does your service need to be functioning correctly for your user to be able to rely on it and not churn? Um, an interesting observation, a bit of an aside, is your user might not be a paying user. Um, I use Gmail. I don't pay for Gmail, but I needed to have a very high uh, level of reliability. That was also something I realized. Like, trying to retain a user doesn't mean that you're re retaining necessarily someone who's paying you money, but you are retaining a user of your service for whatever reason. So um, this, this graph is kind of helpful because the knee-jerk reaction when you speak to someone in management, oh, sorry to disparage managers, <laughs> I kind of am one, but um, not management. Um, when, you, when you speak to anyone really, your knee-jerk reaction is going to be it has to be up 100% of the time. Long story short is anything that's being served over the internet is not going to be served 100% of the time. Your ISP can't, can't hit that. Um, and what you're doing here is a trade-off between how much is it going to cost me to be that highly reliable, both in terms of money and complexity, and will my user actually notice or care if it's down for 43 minutes in a month? So if you, the, long story, the, the, the heart of the matter is the more nines you want, the more you're going to have to pay. And every nine costs you about 10 times as much. So you're making a trade-off here. Not, more is not necessarily good for you. All right. So error budgets. So the way I reason about error budget is this is a, a currency that I have. It is a, a token of user pain that's incredibly, or discomfort, that's incredibly valuable and that I spend wisely. Um, if you look at the graph, okay, so this is where we are now uh, after a couple of years. It didn't start like this. It started as an SH script that spat out a number, and um, there's a story about that. But if you look at the graph, the blue line is the service level indicator I have achieved over time. Up is an incident. I'm burning through my user's patience. I'm burning error budget minutes. Down is I've accumulated time back. And the red line is the service level objective. That's my user's 
pain threshold. That's their patience with me. If I, am in, if I breach that line, if, I, if my system is unstable for more than, in this case, 127 minutes for that month, I have the likelihood that they might feel that my service is no longer valuable or reliable and they might go to competitor X. So, also, interestingly enough, we, we reason in terms of minutes, not percentages. So, like, it's easier to think we burned through five minutes of downtime last, last night, what happened there. Um, one other tips and trick kind of uh, helpful thing was I reason, I talk about this graph as the service level achieved over time. Um, that might help you. So blue line is um, historical data. Red line is the service level objective, the threshold over time. Okay. So given all of these things, I've given you the players. So we've got the platform team, we've got the application, We've got this concept of service level and uh, whether or not we're achieving it. What is the game? What is the challenge? Um, and I, the thought that came to mind was Farmville. It's like you're trying to keep all these things in flight. You're trying to keep your users happy. You're trying to maintain the platform. Um, downtime is usually caused, or inter service interruption is usually caused by changes, and those changes might be very necessary, like uh, maintenance or patching for CVEs, that kind of thing. Also, when you want to release new features and innovate, you're introducing a change, and that, might, that is nine times out of ten the cause of an outage. So the challenge is to manage these conflicting needs. So my platform operator, me, I want stability. Application developers want to release new features. These two things are in conflict, and my end user actually wants both. They want a useful, uh, modern product that is stable. So conflicting needs, platform operator wants stability and security, application developer wants new features to be released so that they can learn and they don't want to worry about security. Finally, the application user wants a level of service and interestingly, they want <coughs> new features. So they want both. So now that I've laid the, laid the ground rule, what have we been learning in the last three years? So that is Elrond. Um, I, I think about this in terms of the Fellowship of the Ring. Uh, we're all in this together. So there, there needs to be buy-in, both from the application development side and the platform side, that when there has been service interruption and we have disturbed our users to the point where they're, we're, we're approaching their threshold of pain, we agree that this is what's going to happen. And in the yellow box, that is the actual literal text of our policy when we are about to breach that SLO line. And it's, um, should the error budget be exceeded, platform updates will be halted, except for features uh, around reliability. And we will do so until 10 minutes of budget has been accrued again. So we're giving our users a bit of a break in stability and we hold back and the only thing that we work on is reliability. Interestingly enough, this would not have worked if the engineering director in Denver, Mark, had not committed to stopping deployments when we, when we agreed that line is now through the red. Um, I, as a lowly platform engineer in Dublin, can't hope to exercise uh, authority over a 50-strong engineering team in Denver, but he does. So we agreed, in, in the interest of, of the users, uh, when, we, when we exceed that line, we stop. <coughs> And we did. Having that agreement ahead of time kind of diffuses the, the tension in the moment it, when it happens. Um, another uh, second example, why did we lower our SLO? If you look at our super cool graph, this is, a, this is an example of what I was talking about. Our, our tooling wasn't right. Our threshold wasn't right um, in this particular instance. But what you're looking at is kind of similar to what we saw on the tracker SLI. So we saw our threshold is X. We saw that um, our, our outages have been quite high and technically all, all holding true, our users should be rather annoyed with us right now. And they weren't. Um, our, our service level objective was too strict. Uh, we were not getting support tickets in. But because of the agreement on the SLO, we had stopped production application developers, you know, stopped pushes to production, stopped releasing. And they were going, why? 
um, no one's complaining. And we had a look and a think, and we were like, yeah, actually. So our service level objective at the time gave us like 43 minutes of um, user patience to spend. And we decided that actually is too strict. So we've now relaxed it a bit, and now we're at 127. So we went from 99.5 to 99.7. And relaxing that allows the dev team to innovate, and we are not artificially restricting them. OK, versioning, kill your zombies. So what, obviously, we're building these things, and we like try it this way and try it that way. And we had um, versions of it lying around. And we had an interesting conversation with Tracker one day, and they were like, you know, we've noticed that we've been um, outside of the SLO for the last three weeks, and you haven't done anything. And we were like, what? And um, so they sent us the URL that they were using, and it was a very old version. Um, with old algorithms, old data. So lesson learned for me was, if you look at the screenshot there, deprecate. The moment that something is dead, don't assume that that URL is, has not been bookmarked by someone somewhere. Um, kill your old versions. Make sure that there's a single source of truth. Um, these numbers are there to collaborate and then cross geolocation, things happen. So just kill something that's no longer relevant. Uh, spend your budget. Um, it has been my observation that uh, people don't like creating downtime deliberately. They don't like burning error budget. Uh, that's a problem. That's a bad thing. Uh, your error budget is there for you to innovate, to stay competitive. It's also there for you to patch your environments. If you're not doing that, um, one is you're kind of training your users to expect a higher level of reliability and they kind of get it, and there's a story there. Um, but fundamentally and most importantly, in a competitive world where other people are also creating software that does what you're doing, your product might be stagnating if you're not innovating. To innovate, you need to create change, and that can result in error budget consumption. Um, when we saw how much budget we had remaining, we also took the initiative to practice some uh, disaster recovery scenarios. We were like, uh, we have 120 minutes. Let's see what happens uh, if the database goes down. Can we recover? And how much time? So we, we had the license to test that out. So it provokes those conversations. Five, five down, five to go. So ownership of the SLI in its definition. Well, this is quite a subtle one. But we, as the platform team, were closer geographically to Google in London. So we worked with them to build these graphs. So what is the service level indicator for Tracker? How do we build it in code? How do we create this pretty graph so we can all look at it and we understand what we need to be prioritizing? But then we started getting questions from the PMs in Tracker saying, we want to change the definition of the SLI. We want to change the definition of what is an unhappy user experience. And that was like email ping pong and opinions and blah, blah, blah. Actually, this is their user. This is not our user. They know better than I do what makes an unhappy or a happy tracker user. So we've gotten to the place now, which is actually quite encouraging, where they are like, can we own this? Can we uh, maintain it and maintain the definition? As someone trying to bootstrap SRE in an organization, that was very encouraging, because they clearly have bought into it, and they understand it, and they want to own it. And it is right that they own it. So I would say, um, Make sure that you are, mon you are taking care of your own users. Our platform users are the tracker application developers. They need to be able to push to production. That is what I care about. They care about how happy are my end users. So we're in a place now where we're handing that over. Uh, team boundary subtleties. This came up in a conversation about a new SLI that we wanted to add. And um, we were talking between ourselves, the platform team and devs, about search. We were like, we want to create a SLI to show whether or not search is functioning correctly. And blah, 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 banter, banter, banter. And then after a while, it became clear to me that we, we might be talking about two very different things here. Uh, you are talking about the application feature, and I am talking about the platform service that supports that feature. I, as a platform team, am willing to and should invest time in making sure my platform service is available adequately. But it is your domain of expertise to make sure that your application feature is functioning correctly. So I would be wise and just keep your spidey senses up 
for ambiguity in some of these meetings. What service are we talking about here? Are we talking about an application feature or a platform backend service? And let that determine who should define it and who should implement it. Okay, dokes. This was a great conversation. I had this about a week and a half ago. I was chatting to one of our customers. They're new. They've started using SLIs and they've been doing it for a year and they're going well. And they had a chat um, with stakeholders and they said, no, we've, we've successfully achieved two and a half nines in 2018. So the stakeholders said, wow, that's great. Let's go for three nines next year. And on the surface, that kind of, okay, fair enough. But then I was like, no, but have your users changed? Do your users need more reliability? Why would you, three nines is not better than two and a half nines. Three nines might be inappropriate or too expensive. You're wasting money. These things cost money and time and complexity. Why would you increase your expenditure on something that's not needed? So there's a subtlety there about making sure that everybody understands what these tools are. Three nines is not better than two and a half nines in this instance. <laughs> too soon. Uh, also, uh, as our team got wiser about these things, we were, we were coaching other product teams within Pivotal how to use these. And we would find that products very early in their um, development, this would be noise to them. We would, we would, we are convinced that this is important and we use it for a, for a, a mature, tea, uh, mature product in, in production. These teams were young. They didn't really yet know who their users were and they didn't, <coughs> certainly didn't know what their most important workflows were. Anything they were doing was a guess. It's become my conviction, and I hold it loosely, but it's become my conviction that there's a time when this is too early. In lean product development, in the beginning, you're iterating fast. You want to learn quickly. You want to push to production quickly and see things go down and break and upset users. That's not a time to be using a tool that is created to retain users. So if you haven't identified your user cohort or your, your, your customer, this is probably not, you're probably just going to be wasting a lot of effort ahead way too early. You're too, the product might be too young to need this right now or to benefit from it. You don't need to do it all. Don't let the book intimidate you. Um, there's a lot of stuff in there. Um, our team has not used it all. We have used the subset to great, great success and benefit. Um, I find that different teams with different challenges uh, develop different muscle. So I would say start with an understanding of the level of service and that is chapter four in the book. Start there. It, um, if you are overwhelmed with paging, if you are overwhelmed with incidents, then go look at those chapters in the book and they are very wise. I've used some of those things, thankfully not as often as other people, but our, our product is stable. So we have prioritized our attention in other ways. So don't, don't, if I look at that character, that's quite ungainly. Like if I haven't figured out how to use the shield and the sword, all this other nonsense on me is just gonna get in the way. So use the thing that is addressing the pain that you're feeling right now in your team, start there. Um, and then the last one, um, you can't force feed buy into this. This kind of uh, goes back to the, is your product too young? Um, in Pivotal, we uh, train people that have recently purchased Pivotal Cloud Foundry, various skills, so um, uh, automation of upgrades to the product, blah, blah, blah. In the early days, because they haven't run anything in production, they haven't really felt any of the pain that SRE addresses. So it can be almost a, a labor in futility to try and force feed this into their day-to-day uh, -day practices when this is not a problem that they're currently facing and they can react with it as like, a, you're wasting my time, this is a toy, can we just get down to basics and get something into production? Perhaps then is not the right time to start trying to socialize these things. We, we did so well with Tracker because Tracker had been in production for years before we got on the scene and they knew that if you don't stay on top of these things, it can overwhelm you. So they, they were already bought in before we got there. So don't, don't try and force something on someone that's not convinced of its value. Okie dokie, so I've writ we've written a couple of blogs. Um, uh, we go into more detail there. 
um, might be helpful if you want to have a look. Uh, we speak about um, how we have used it over time. We also chat a bit with uh, some of the people in Pivotal that create the obs observability tool suites um, that we have to support operators. So that might be useful. So in summary, we got there. So um, cloud ops. So in SRE, use it when you once you actually need it. Uh, don't try and utilize something that is not addressing a pain you're feeling. Start somewhere. Don't be afraid to uh, iterate on adjusting where the service level objective is or adjusting what probe, what, what the SLI is testing. When your understanding of what an unhappy user changes, change the probe. Um, this only really makes sense once you have market fit, so don't try and use it too early. Don't try to use everything from day one because um, you uh, you're not going to be convinced and you feel like you're wasting your time. Uh, pay attention to language subtleties. Make sure that you understand particularly what the system is under test or observation. Um, take care of your users. So as a platform engineer, I take care of the user journeys or the workflows of developers pushing to my platform. Uh, those developers need to create their own graphs to take care of the users of their software that they're creating. Um, the cross-team fellowship of the ring, fellowship of the SLO policy. Uh, if you don't have that agreement, you're really going to struggle. Um, so there has to be buy-in both by the, the dev team, the platform team, and the people above them that can defend decisions that are being made for this policy. Spend your budget, innovate, don't be too um, conservative. That money, that, money that, that time is there for a very valid reason. Kill your zombies, single source of truth. Don't let old artifacts lie around because they can cause confusion and um, misalignment. And then finally, adjust as you learn. So you're not going to get this right in the first try. Don't worry, it's fine, you're learning. Um, we've been adjusting as we've been going. Cool. So that is that. That's me. I hope that was helpful. All right, thank you.